Okay. So uh, with, now that we've had that background, a couple different background contextualization discussions, lectures, uh, let's talk about what's going on right now um, as we speak in um, Ukraine. Obviously, uh, there's a, a war going on and all the horrible evilness that comes along with wars. Um, <clears throat> again, not, not the typical purview of our disasters class, but in the context of radiological releases, we need to talk about this. So um, Russia uh, invades uh, Ukraine in, two, in 2014, ostensibly because uh, they didn't like uh, democracy, basically, and wanted to have their own puppet regime in charge. Um, the short version is um, uh, the folks in Ukraine, which was a, obviously a, a member of the former Soviet Union, not a part of NATO, so the as you can imagine being a buffer state between modern day Russia and, and Europe. Um, essentially in the last couple of decades, Ukraine has been turning more towards the West, more interested in democracy, this and that. And in the lead up to 2014, there was some interest in having a trade agreement with Europe. Uh, Putin didn't like that. He had a, a puppet, uh, puppet um, uh, ruler in there and but a bunch of street protests, essentially he was ousted. He ran away to hide in um, Russia. And then uh, sort of in response, um, Russia invaded the extreme uh, southeast of the country and it took it over. And they've remained an occupying force in that part of uh, Ukraine since 2014. So most folks say the proper way to describe the current active invasion and war that's going on in Ukraine is just a continuation of that. Um, regardless, um, uh, Ukraine is a big country. Ukraine generates a lot of uh, grain, a large fraction of the sunflower oil used around the, um, the world, et cetera. And, and, uh, and so you know, large country, um, uh, lots of uh, uh, foodstuffs, et cetera. They also have uh, a fair amount of nuclear power. So this is where we'll get to Chernobyl after we have the conversation about what's going on. But this is where Chernobyl is. This is the country uh, where we find that um, worst so far of nuclear uh, accidents and radiological releases in the history of the world. Um, and so uh, this is one. Uh, this is a plant in the um, sort of central south. Uh, of the of the country, um, this is the largest power plant uh, in Europe of its of the, of its kind, and uh, six reactors, huge thing. And so, uh, as with other uh, developing uh, countries or countries that are sort of developing capacity, um, uh, countries that have more sophisticated experience with uh, nuclear power plants do help and 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 training and this and that. And so one of the things they've done in the last few years is to put their uh, real-time data online. And so as of March 2nd, so a couple of days ago, this is what, if you went to the website, this is what it looked like. So you can see it uh, uh, in, in different languages. I have this set to the English language. And so you can see stuff. Um, uh, uh, when I grabbed this, this was an archive version. So there isn't real-time weather um, because of the app. But basically, it's it's you know, real time measurements of how much radiation is inside, outside, all that kind of stuff. That was on the second. Uh, and so everything was working normal back then, even though this is after the onset of the invasion by Russia. So this is this is as the war is going on. This plant is still operating, supplying power to the grid, etc. Um, nuclear form forms a large fraction of Ukraine's electrical uh, energy generation capacity. So a bit more than half of their electricity comes from this nest of uh, 15 different nuclear reactors across the country. So relatively high. Uh, the next most uh, common source would be coal and then a mix of biomass and, and natural gas and other things. Um, this is what it. This is what things look like as of um, 
a couple days ago. So the this, so we're looking at the country of Ukraine. The the hashed hatched thing right here is where is the region that was invaded in 2014. And then the red is where invading Russian forces are have currently uh, are currently occupying and they're they're making advances as we speak. So this is this is you know already out of date, but just to give you a sense. So they're they're coming in from the from Belarus, they're coming in from the north, they're coming in from Russia, and they have floating, they have naval uh, um, uh, vessels and things, and they're coming in uh, from the south, and they're trying to take over this important uh, port of Odessa. Uh, uh, now these things, these gray things, are coal plants. These blue things are nuclear power plants. This is where Chernobyl uh, is, and where, and where that 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 uh, plant had its meltdown in 1986. Um, but uh, you can see as, as and so one of the first things the Russians did was, was go try to take over Chernobyl. And they did, and they, they're in control of that now. What happened uh, this week, the end of last week on the weekend is they took over this current uh, power plant. They're currently now running towards taking over the South Ukraine plant right here. Uh, this is a normal thing that's done in war, right? The the uh, the invading uh, force wants to control the people they're trying to kill, and so they want to control power, uh, communications, all that kind of stuff. And so they're hoping to get control of these power plants as they have over here, and then essentially turn off the power, so that folks that are trying to talk on their cell phones, whatever, would have a harder time, uh, you know, powering up their cell phones. Uh, this is what uh, happened uh, three three nights three nights ago. Okay, so um, you can see it's a modern facility, right? Uh, a computer control, all that, all that stuff. Um, it might be a little bit hyperbolic to say the the you know safety of the entire world is being endangered, but clearly this is a major worry when you have. So <clears throat> we design power plants to deal with whatever hurricanes, earthquakes, you know that kind of stuff. We don't generally speaking design them to deal with mortar rounds and missile attacks and things of that nature, right? So uh, on the 24th, the Russians invaded. And again, the, one of the first things they did was run in from the north and, and occupy uh, Chernobyl, uh, the exclusion zone there around the former plant site. That's a 30 kilometer diameter uh, exclusion zone. And so they, they grabbed control of that. Um, again, no power being generated there, so not as much of a worry um, per se. That's right, that's right, that's right. And so then <clears throat> on the fourth, this plant that we just saw became the first nuclear power plant, uh, civilian nuclear power plant um, to come um, under armed attack. There have been some terrorist type of things here and there, but, but nothing with an, an actual organized army Trying to come in and attack. So this is this is truly unprecedented. And so uh, some Russian something uh, hit part of the plant, and people started freaking out. And uh, at first, well, yeah, I'll, I'll you guys see. So so um, and then they started shutting down these six reactors. They actually started shutting them down before the Russians started started attacking. But um, so we'll watch this little short segment of the news. Which is 
in terms of emergency services have now been reduced to access. Very foreign residents in Utah could have gone to Russia early to stop fire immediately and then just dark. And it's inevitable when the largest nuclear power plant is like in Europe uh, catches fire and smoke is seen around what now seems to be the perimeter of this administrative building, uh, so not the actual reactors themselves, which is a relief to people. But the US president has been speaking to the Ukrainian president about it. We're hearing updates about this plant on the US Energy Secretary. They're saying that, uh, that it has robust containment structures and the reactors have been safely shut down. So from that point of view, that's concerning. But uh, both President Zelensky and Biden are appealing the Russians to let firefighters in and appealing for this area, for the fighting to stop around this area. So Russian tanks were trying to take hold of the plant in the last couple of days, but there were resistance from workers and, and residents of the area. Uh, and this has seems to have escalated in shelling, which has been blamed on the Russians by a neighboring mayor that caused the smoke to rise. And if I could just uh, just say, bring up here in this conversation, just to say, obviously, we're looking at pictures of that nuclear plant. Uh, it is reasonably difficult to work out exactly what has been going on there. We've been scanning the pictures now for the last couple of hours or so. Um, okay. So, <clears throat> so this is uh, an aerial view of that plant. And so here you can see these six uh, uh, replicate reactors. So here's one, two, three, four, five, six. They're basically identical. Um, and each of these has its own containment structure, its own, uh, you know, reactor core, et cetera. And so, you know, you could turn one on, two on, three on, four on, all of them, et cetera. This now appears to be what was being hit. This is a training facility, administrative facility. Um, so, you know, it's a couple hundred feet from these things, right? So we got, we got super lucky, right? And based on the other things that are going on around Ukraine, this does not seem to be highly skilled, you know, people actively targeting this. It, I suppose it could have been, but based on, you know, the shelling that's going on and the indiscriminate uh, killing of folks, I think we just ended up getting lucky here. So once the fire started, uh, the initial re first responders, the firefighters were prevented from coming in because the Russian army said, you know, stay away. And then at some point there was some kind of negotiation made, then they were allowed to come in. And so where we are right now is all of the uh, operators are, or I don't know, all, but at least, a, at least a, you know, competent crew or whatever capacity of operators are in the plant and they're in the process of shutting it down. And they're under, you know, the direct order of soldiers. So the Ukrainians are, the Ukrainian engineers that historically operate this are the ones turning the dials, but they have guys with guns, you know, standing over their shoulder, telling them to turn everything off, basically. Uh, and this is, I showed you what the dashboard is. If you go there today, this is what the dashboard will look like. There is no data coming out. So one of the first things they did was turn off all the communications, or at least most of the communications off the internet, et cetera. And so, um, you know, presumably everything's okay there, but we don't have any more data as you would expect uh, in a war zone. Okay, so what are the risks about this, right? So the risks are a, a few here. Um, first and foremost, we could have um, radioactive materials. Um, you know, if you're blowing up bombs and kicking crud up in the air, you could be um, turning those particles that are together up into dispersed particles in the air. Um, if we talk about the, the Chernobyl area um, where there was, you know, decent amount of shelling and people trying to fight back and stuff. The worry is one, that you just kick up stuff in general. Two, uh, well, I think everybody stayed well away. Theoretically, one of the concerns is that you would hit the sarcophagus, which is the concrete tomb that we first put around that site. And then uh, a couple of years ago, we added a new, um, a new shell essentially over that. Both of those could theoretically be damaged by getting a you know, missile land on it or something like that, and then open up, re-expose the radioactive materials of the atmosphere, that would be bad. Um, with regards to the current power plants where, you know, Russia apparently has no qualms at throwing explosives towards, obviously the main concern there is an uncontrolled reactor, um, and then ultimately a meltdown. So what we have to understand is, uh, 
these power plants need power to operate, right? And so, so uh, to shut them down depends on, on which system, depends on, on, on how much it's running, but it can take from many hours to days to sometimes weeks to shut down these reactors. You can't just like flick a switch and go, like if there's a windmill, we turn it off or a solar panel or even like a coal fire power plant, flip some switches and within, you know, a few minutes or, or so we'd, we'd spin everything down, not with this stuff. And so we have to make sure that we're still cooling the radioactive fuel so it doesn't overheat. And so we need pumps, we need circulating systems, things of that nature to, to remove that built up heat um, as, it, as it safely cools down. And we need power for that. Now, all of these modern power plants have their own generators, just in case there is an earthquake or something like that, right? We can boom, fire up our own diesel power generators or whatever and, and, and go through that process. But again, when you're being shelled, uh, maybe those generators aren't gonna work. And by definition, Russia is going through and shutting down the electrical grid, right? So, so normally, if you, if you had a problem, you would just suck off power from the grid, right? And you'd be okay. So, so that source is absolutely endangered. The ability to run on-site backup systems is obviously potentially endangered in a war situation. And so those are, those are a problem. Um, as of the other day, uh, it looked like six of Ukraine's 15 reactors were offline. And now it looks like uh, more are going offline. Um, uh, then, of course, we could also just have a, a horrible bomb that hits the, the reactor uh, uh, vessel itself and scatters you know, uh, the, the fuel rods themselves. The other thing, which nobody seems to be, or not many people seem to be talking about, is um, we also have these vast, so every power plant in the U.S., we store our nuclear waste on site because we do not have, for example, in the U.S., we do not have a, a, a disposed, unapproved federal um, repository site for our waste. So San Onofre, uh, 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 where you, you pick your site, all the spent fuel that's ever been used by that plant is on site. And the same thing is going on here in this in the Ukraine situation. So we have these pools, these water pools on site where we have the spent fuel. So the depleted fuel rods are sitting in there. So it doesn't necessarily take just a, an explosion on the main reactor. It could also hit one of these storage areas, which are much larger on average than the, than the uh, you know, individual reactors. The individual reactors are also generally pre, you know, pretty reinforced with containment structures and stuff. Uh, not all of our fuel rod storage areas are so well protected. And then of course, the last thing that we would all hope no one would do is, is someone can get hold of this stuff and do nefarious uh, things with it. Um, uh, so, uh, my God, Ukraine, horrible. Oh my God, poor folks there. Evil invasion for no real reason, um, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, we're not, <coughs> we're not totally unique here. Wow, this plant that was attacked uh, a couple of days ago in Ukraine is the first time an army has set upon a nuclear power plant. Um, but we have had bad actors, and this paper came out, this analysis came out in December. And uh, one of the maps it showed was some potential modeling. Uh, and so there have been some individual folks trying to get access to reactors, in this case, it's in the Middle East. And so they're showing, so again, uh, uh, Ukraine is up here, can't quite see it off this map, but these are all areas, if we were to have a containment, areas that might get contaminated with radiation given atmospheric patterns and everything. So um, uh, this notion of having to protect our, our infrastructure from people actively trying to break it is unfortunately um, a, more, a more common thing that we're gonna have to deal with. Okay, questions about that? Any questions about what's going on in Ukraine right now with, with regards to nuclear releases and things of that nature? So, so far it's important to say that we haven't seen any, any spikes. Uh, I mean, it's a war zone, so it's hard to know exactly, but, but at least anecdotally, there appears to be no major radiological releases. 
so that's good. So in the area around Chernobyl, uh, in the area around the plant that fell before the weekend, the one that's under attack right now, so far, at least as of when we started our lecture, there's no big spikes. So that's, so that's good. So these are concerns and serious worries, but we don't have th these, these disasters that I described haven't played out um, yet, thankfully. Cool. Anything else people wonder about? Okay. All right, so let's talk about the before times in Ukraine. So let's talk about Chernobyl, which is the worst nuclear um, radiological release in, into the environment that we've had so far um, uh, from, a, from a power plant. Obviously we dropped nuclear weapons on Japan, but, but uh, as far as power generation, this was the worst. So this was, um, so my birthday is end of April, uh, in, uh, and this was my 16th birthday. And I was getting ready to, to go out, I think to dinner or something with my dad or like a late lunch or something with, 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 with my family. And uh, uh, this stuff started flashing on the news. It had started two days beforehand, but because this was the Soviet Union, it was like, you know, it was kind of, how do we know something was up? We knew something was up because surrounding countries in Europe, their Geiger counters started tick, 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 tick. They're like, what the heck is this, right? So it was not a notice from a fellow government saying, oh my God, you guys, hey, just as a quick heads up, it was, it was detecting it uh, in people's you know, own backyards. Okay, so this is 1986. Um, so what, what happened? So this was a, a, a Soviet era nuclear power plant, not very sophisticated, uh, uh, not very safe design. Um, and uh, was, was, a, was a big giant plant, essentially. Uh, this was a graphite reactor. So my other lecture, I go over a little bit the different types of um, nuclear uh, reactors, but it doesn't matter. It's just, it's just, it's an old style. It's not considered safe and we don't make these anymore. Um, and so what essentially happened was um, it allowed for the buildup. So when we think about, these nuclear power plants, again, we have the control rod things going on, right? So we have the things that interfere with the reaction, slow down the reaction or, or, or pull them out and let it go faster. We have this idea of moving this heat energy from around the radioactive material uh, elsewhere, transferred in such a way that the radiation doesn't get out, right? So it's, it's conducted through metals and other liquids. So there's no so when we, we see those, when we see these classic cooling towers, just to make sure we're all on the same page, when we see, when we see, when we see these things, right? Just to be clear, that's not radiation. That's just water that we're recondensing. We're taking from steam, turning it back into liquid water so that we can use it for cooling. So it's very dramatic, especially when it's a cool day like this, you take a picture, but just to be clear, that's, there should be nothing radi there should be nothing radioactive in that, in that cloud other than just background atmospheric stuff. Um, right, okay. So uh, what happened with, what happened with, with this bad boy was um, uh, because, so when things go wrong, when the heat starts to build up or whatever, one of the things we can have uh, a very common potential hazard, and this happens several times with a lot of our radiological releases, is hydrogen can build up. And hydrogen, just like we know the, the Hindenburg, right? It's very flammable, boom, it can explode, pop. And that's essentially what happened here. We had a, we had a buildup of, um, uh, of, not radioactive stuff, but pressurized material that essentially exploded and breached the containment um, area. As that breach happened, that broke the rest of the cooling system. And then, and then we weren't able to cool it and it got into this feedback loop of make things worse, make things worse, get hotter, get hotter, and no real way to, to deal with it. Um, and the, the folks, doing operation also didn't have all the 
right instrumentation, they didn't know how to respond, et cetera. So it was both a physical problem and a human operator problem that led to I did, oh, that happened twice. Okay, so yeah, basically, right? So here we go. Uh, so here's the here's the the fuel. Um, uh, essentially, it it blew, and once it blew, these things weren't able to to circulate, and then it got hotter and hotter, and started to essentially melt down, and was an uncontrolled became an uncontrolled reaction. Um, thirty one people died. Some things I've read said thirty, others say thirty one, but I think thirty one is the right number. Um, these are uh, died either immediately, you know, because of those burns like we're talking about, or within a few days or, or weeks or so. Um, and these are folks that were physically in proximity to the reactor. So the firefighters, the, the emergency responders, those kinds of folks. Um, and there was a huge amount of radiation release, something like at least 5% of the physical material that was in the fuel rods went into the atmosphere, which is a massive amount um, and, and spread all around Europe. So uh, Turkey, where I've, I've worked a lot, um, everybody in Turkey drinks tea, they drink chai, and they grow, uh, the most popular tea they like is this apple tea. Um, and, uh, and for the longest time, people are like, yeah, I'm not drinking the apple tea because all the, all the, the tea bushes you know, are all contaminated. And uh, it took famously a, a politician to go up and go, I drink tea, I'm not afraid of tea, right? And drank the tea and then, uh, yeah, turns out uh, he didn't normally drink the tea, he just did it on TV. But um, uh, uh, all kinds of issues around um, concern, worry, et cetera. Now here's, a, here's the important part. So this is the part that, that plays into, to, yes, bad reactor design, we can train people. But this is a, a, a consistent thing that's happening with so many of our nuclear accidents right here. Here we go. Ready? So the horrible thing happens, the bad decision, the bad design, whatever. But then the human psychology comes into play. And there does seem to be something, dis not distinct, at least much more intense with radiological disasters than with earthquakes or tornadoes or these other uh, things that we've been talking about. Our confidence in nuclear energy is takes a huge hit here, right? Um, and and lack of information, lack of transparency, just trust us, right? All the stuff we were just talking about at the start of the lecture about about uh, you know darkness, unknown is more scary, right? You're not getting any information, and you have a Geiger counter, and a Geiger counter goes, yeah, most of them go, it's like, oh my god, it sounds like crackling and scary, and what does this mean? And am I going to die? And is my kid going to die? And you know, to it just like so the tension just spikes to the roof. Every stress through the roof. You guys had a sense of that during the early days of the coronavirus pandemic, right? It's kind of like, what's going on? People are saying, don't touch something. You got to bleach your Amazon boxes because oh my God, you might you know all that kind of stuff. Uh, since then, we have a, a Chernobyl tissue bank where we've been studying. Um, what has been going on with uh, the event. Uh, it's, it's not perfect. We didn't, we didn't grab all the tissues that maybe we want to initially, but the consensus is that we've seen something like 5,000 thyroid cancers, uh, which translate into 15 deaths. And again, these are not the first responders. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about just the regular residents uh, that were in villages and, and farms and stuff around, around uh, Chernobyl that were evacuated, right? So, so that, that were taken away or, or moved away. Um, and so the direct quote is, no evidence of a major public health impact attributable to radiation exposure 20 years after the incident, after the accident. And there's been little detectable increase in other cancers. Most of the impact here is mostly on young, on, on people that were young when the accident happened. And that's, we think, because they're still actively growing. And so their thyroids are still a lot of active metabolism and they were taking in more iodine when in, in, in that could impact their thyroid more so than somebody like me, more, than, more so than an old guy. Um, yes, right. Um, 
And so we ended up evacuating almost a third of a million people out of this exclusion zone, right? So resettled them. Uh, and, and some of this is still ongoing to this day. Um, the war has obviously interrupted that, but, but this, is a, this is a thing. Um, the greatest damage, so obviously this was a huge problem. I'm not trying to minimize this. This was problematic. All kinds of bad things you know, came from this. Dozens of people died, right? Trying to fight this directly because of this failure. But it's much more likely that the misinformation, the panic, the stress, the jump on the street and drive away as fast as you can to get in a car accident probably killed more people and harmed more people than the actual direct radiation, right? And that's, that's a generalized thing with many of our accidents. Again, not talking about Hiroshima or Nagasaki, but as far as these power plant releases, um, it, it's, it's, it's the fear, it's our reaction to them, as opposed to the actual direct physical cells being changed by the, the ionizing radiation that, that seems to be doing more problem. Eventually, we entomb the whole site in this concrete sarcophagus that we call it, uh, basically a big coffin, big tomb. And then uh, a few years ago, we added another protective structure over, essentially over that. Um, so concrete and steel and essentially bury it is what we did. Um, interestingly, the impact zone, and we've seen the same thing with Fukushima, has become something of a wilderness awesome place, right? So people aren't allowed to go hunt there, right? People aren't, aren't fragmenting the environment any more than they already fragmented the environment, right? So um, there are some problematic mutations with some of the critters, but, and we, can, we can clearly see the impact of that, but turns out the footprint of humanity is so large that in at least many cases, the net benefit is outweighed by the detriment of the radiation. So getting people out of the picture has been better for the deer population, bear population, uh, uh, that those kinds of critters. Um, and so we have a, a, essentially a de facto national park or protected area. Um, yeah, we'll skip Hiroshima. Okay, so other things that are real important to talk about here at this point is the popular perception of all this risk, which again is different than all, than all of our other natural disasters. And that is this idea because we started with this, this form of energy started with a um, with war, right? There's this association with pain, suffering, horribleness, all that jazz, right? And so the classic representation of this is Godzilla. Has anybody, has anybody watched this or the original Godzilla movie, 1954? So I would suggest you guys go watch it over, over spring break. Um, so it, it looks, you know, so we all focus on the monster, right? And this, this dude in a rubber suit, right? Like, oh, it's sort of cheesy. It's like 1950s sci-fi, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> right? But watch it with this lens, which is, this was meant as a critique. So who created the Godzilla movie? Japanese film industry, right? What's the story of... You guys tell me, do you, anybody remember what the, 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 the rough story of Godzilla is? The second Emma can hear. Right. Right. No, it's nuclear testing. It's, it's atomic bomb detonations in the Pacific awaken the creature. The creature is Godzilla. And so you should watch it and look at it. So it's, 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 it's um, Raymond Burr, the guy that played Ironsides, the old actor that you might recognize is the, is the sort of American hero because you have to have like an American, you know, old white dude be the hero. You couldn't possibly have a Japanese person. Um, but but it's, it's sort of, you know, badly dubbed and all this kind of stuff. But, but watch the backstory. So the backstory of these Japanese scientists and they're like, they're worried about radiation, 
right? And so Godzilla, in a sort of cheesy, low-budget way, is meant to embody this, this angst, this like, oh my God, this stuff is, is, is so scary. It's creating monsters of the world, right? It's, it's, it's changing the natural world and making the natural world something scary. That's the, that's the thing with Godzilla. So it gets, it gets treated as, you know, popcorn movie and everything, but, but that's at its, at its nut, that was at its core, that, that was the, the thing with Godzilla. And that idea then sticks. And essentially every sci-fi movie in the 50s and 60s is, is either an alien or radiation, right? Radiation makes the ant get big. Radiation makes the spider get big. Radiation changes someone into a vampire. Radiate, right? So radiation becomes this, this existential worry, right? And, and that is, you cannot separate that background cultural understanding from people's perception of the risk from nuclear power plants. Yeah, Em. So watch this one. So you guys should go watch this 50, the original, original version, the black and white one, and, and, and look at it through the lens we're talking about and see if you can find evidence of, of the, that perception and that, that cultural, the, 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 the nucleus of that cultural memory. Um, okay, let's jump forward to Three Mile Island. Three Mile Island, Pennsylvania. This is a, now we're in the 70s, late 70s, 79. Um, and uh, this is uh, a power plant. Uh, have a problem. And uh, now there's always warnings. These are, these are complex systems, right? These are, imagine the engineering, very, all kinds of sensors and lights and blah, blah, blah. So there's constantly things going wrong, right? So as, as an operator, one of the things you need to do is, is understand, oh, that thing goes in there, I need to tweak that. That thing over there, I got to flip that. This thing is not a big deal, this thing is a major deal, all that kind of stuff. So they have an alarm that kicks in uh, in the early morning shift. <clears throat> and so they say there's a little bit of problem. So they, they turn this uh, pressure relief valve. Remember we talked about the, 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 the is this a pressurized uh, uh, water reactor here? So not like the Chernobyl one. Um, and uh, um, anyway, so we're venting some stuff and it sticks open. So we're starting to lose some of the coolant. Oh my gosh, you know, big problem. So uh, folks um, didn't do, didn't go through the right steps. And um, uh, they think that they, they resolve it. They, they close that valve. And so they, they now have a, a closed container again and everything seems to be okay. But it turns out that uh, the sensors were a little faulty and the water was actually lower than they thought it was. And so uh, fuel rods were in the air. They weren't in liquid or at least a little bit of the fuel rods were in the air and that allowed them to build up, build up, build up, started having more, um, you know, hotter and hotter and eventually releases a bunch of radiation inside the vessel, inside the containment vessel itself. And all these alarms start going off and everything. And uh, yeah, so like I said before, we talked about before about the, this notion of a hydrogen buildup and hydrogen's explosive. And so there was a lot of fear that, that um, if, if this thing blows, it'll blow up the whole containment structure. And so they go, everybody has to get the hell out of here. And so the surrounding communities in Pennsylvania, it's evacuate, go, 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 right? And it, like we talked about before, it's like, oh my God, I'm going to die, right? My baby's going to die. My my husband's gonna die, my kids are gonna die, right? So let's jump in the car and like, woo! Um, but thankfully that explosion didn't happen. So we released, we vented some, 
material of the atmosphere, but, we, but it didn't lead to a, a blow up. So the crisis was averted, uh, you know, thank God it was it ended up being okay, but it became very clear that we need way better operator training and way better communication with the public as to how to signal when we have a real emergency. Is it freak out and run fast? Is it just sort of go sort of quickly? Is it, you know, like that kind of thing, right? And so this is 1979. This wasn't in the 50s or 60s or 40s or something. This is, you know, this is, um, you know, modern times basically. Um, and so nobody was killed. One person, you know, a little bit twist an ankle kind of thing or something like that. Oh, had like a heart attack or something. Um, right, so uh, what happens? So now the scientists, the engineers go in front of the public, go, it's cool, it's cool, relax, we got it. Yes, it was close, it was very scary there for a bit, but we got it under control. Don't you worry about it. We have it all under control. The science dudes got you. Um, and uh, ultimately, nobody's, people, some people are saying like, oh, I got sick from this. There's, none of those actually carry legal weight and, and all those lawsuits are eventually dismissed about after about 20 years of litigation. Um, and we do all the improvements I mentioned. So here's the important thing here. So this is Three Mile Island. So capacity is, is you know, uh, in megawatts. So this is installed capacity. So this means like, you know, essentially how many generators and things of that nature and how big they are, et cetera, in blue on this axis. On this axis, this is how much we, how much, how many megawatts per hour we're actually generating. This is when Three Mile Island happened. So we were on this, we were on this kind of exponential growth, and then we got knocked off track. Right? We got knocked off track. And so we kind of stumbled for a bit. Now it takes a while. It takes a couple decades essentially to get permitted to construct, to fully turn on, et cetera, a nuclear power plant. And so check it out. So it's, it takes a dip. So things are paused for a bit and then kind of keep going, but then check it out. About uh, a decade or so after Three Mile Island, we level off. And it's about 30 years before we permit another uh, nuclear uh, power plant. Uh, for, for electrical generation in the US. So this is flat. Now we start to get better. We get more efficient at making our reactors work, maybe some, some improved turbines and some other things. So we, we actually, uh, the, the efficiency is going up and we keep producing more energy. From, and this is actually, and notice that we're actually losing some installed capacity starting about here. We drop down, we drop down some more, we drop down some more. So even with that loss of the, the number of, gener of, of reactor units, we're still, we're still more efficient, which is cool. But this is the big story, right? The story the, the nuclear industry will say is that environmentalists made it totally unsafe for us. Environmentalists like killed us. Environmentalists said this and that. Environmentalists didn't do that, right? Three Mile Island did that. It just so happens a couple weeks before this event happens, the Hollywood version opens. So another movie you might want to watch over spring break is this movie called The China Syndrome. And so in this, in this fictional account, which seemed on its face to look a lot like this Three Mile Island thing, uh, you have a reporter and you have a nuclear power plant engineer and something is amiss and they have a, 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 near, a, a, a near meltdown and these folks essentially catch it on film and he's trying to get the story out and the, the evil corporate overlords are sitting there watching trying to squash the, the freedom of information and all that stuff, right? So the, the title of the film is a made up thing. It is not real. The title of the film is called The China Syndrome. And the idea is supposed to mean that if, if one of these nuclear runaway reaction happens, it'll get so hot 
it'll just burn down into the <laughs> into the earth and then somehow go to the core of the earth and then pop out the other side of the earth and you'd end up in China, even though China is not on the opposite side, but anyway, the, but you get the idea, right? The idea was a sensationalist thing that essentially it's gonna be this uncontrolled thing is gonna just burn through the earth, right? And that's the title of the film. So this was, this was out in theaters. It was kind of like, okay, you know, kind of like whatever popcorn movie or something, right? But then when Three Mile Island happened, everybody was like, what? So the Godzilla types of stuff are experienced in World War II types of stuff. The fear about radiation types of stuff primed us, right? And then we had a, a, a Hollywood dramatical version with all the great Hollywood special effects and all the great acting and all that kind of stuff right before we had this massive disaster. So again, the industry will blame environmentalists or this or that. The reality is these folks did it to themselves, right? So the public um, was, has, has been burned in terms of trust in terms of confidence in this. Um, uh, and and so, uh, so to be sure, environmentalists played a role, but as with many of these issues, as with clearing old growth forests, as with over harvesting fish populations, uh, the environmentalists tend to come in after there's a problem, like, yo, yo, this doesn't make any sense. And then the extractive industry type folks end up saying, well, you know, it was all fine until you messed it up, right? So there's a lot of shifting of blame here. Um, uh, so clearly, one of the benefits of these of this power source is that obviously it's it's right. We're not having anywhere. There are carbon emissions associated with it a lot, but nothing like burning fossil fuels, right? So so that's that's the debate. Do we want to keep this uh, energy source going or not? And so hence where we are right now. Um, okay, so then uh, questions so far? Everything's very quiet. I'm, I'm not having a very interactive lecture today, sorry. Is, is this making sense to everybody? Any, anybody any questions so far about anything we're talking about? I think I'm just up here yakking away. Okay, okay so then let's talk a little bit uh, very briefly about Fukushima. So Fukushima, uh, again, Japanese isolated island, right? Uh, recovering from World War II, uh, don't have a lot of oil and gas deposits or things of that nature, right? They do have a fair amount of, of, of geothermal, right? The very tectonically active place, a lot of volcanoes and things. Um, so they have some of that, but, but you know, very high tech, very energy intensive society. They need power. And so they lean into nuclear power in a big, bad way and uh, starting in the 60s. And so uh, uh, Tokyo Electric Power Company or TEPCO uh, has these um, uh, plants all around and, and they start installing them around. So the Fukushima Daiichi plant is uh, right here. It's on the west coast of, uh, you know, facing the Pacific, facing California, basically. And here you can see, we have these different reactor vessels. So here's, or uh, uh, yeah. No, I'll say that reactor structures. So we have these guys here. Now, again, very active tectonic area. So they build this seawall system here, which Dr. Patch can tell you all about. Um, so this is designed to prevent, um, uh, I think this was like a five meter uh, tidal wave or, or tidal surge, tsunami, uh, or, or something around there. Um, Okay, so when right before the earthquake and then tsunami hit, uh, only three of the units were operating. This one didn't have any radioactive material in it. Uh, these had fuel in it, but they were they were um, they were not the, the, you know, all the control rods and stuff were in place. They weren't actively producing energy. So the the um, active areas are right here. But have a look at it, right? Like so much of our infrastructure, it's right on the coast, like right, 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 right on the coast, right? Um, it, it, yeah, whatever. It's, it's, so it's, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a modern design. I'll just say that it's modern design. This is what the inside is when they're building it. It's a picture from when they're building it. 
So this is what the uh, main vessel looks like. And uh, they were, they've, they modified it several times based on things they learned most explicitly in the wake of 9-11. Uh, and people were aware of some of the potential problems in the wake of um, things like Hurricane Katrina, where our hospitals lost power because we often put our generators in the basement. And when the hurricane came, it, you know, it flooded and the generators couldn't work. So, so there, was, there, there was this notion that we had to modify some stuff and do some uh, new designs to it. Um, uh, basically, this is the primary uh, uh, containment structure. And then we have this big cement um, uh, encasement around it. Um, so in 2011, almost, almost uh, 11 years ago to the day, um, we have this very large, we haven't had our, our earthquake lecture yet, but we've had a, we have a very large, massive earthquake, right? Very close, offshore, but very close to the um, uh, uh, coastline of Japan. Uh, this is the largest, to date, this is the largest earthquake in Japan's history. And it's the fourth, fourth largest earthquake recorded um, since we've been keeping track of these things, right? So this is, a, this is a massive, massive earthquake. This wasn't a quote unquote regular earthquake. And so the resulting tsunami is not five meters, but it's 15 meters. So that's 50 feet, right? So where we're sitting right now, the way if we were at the coast, it would be, you know, breaking through the window here uh, compared to where we're sitting here in the lab. Um, it, it crushed stuff, right? It, it knocked things out. So it turns out that the earthquake, that the plant responded correctly when the earthquake happened. So it, it scrammed. The automatic start to shut down, drop the you know, control rods and like start to turn off. That worked well. That, that worked as designed. That was well designed, properly executed, all that stuff. But then the tsunami came and just doused the whole plant right? Broke everything up. So again, just like the worry about Ukraine, now we've lost, so, so the regular, so stuff just broke. Our backup generators flooded and broke. So we don't have the ability, so we've lost connection with the grid. We've lost connection with our ability to make power on site. And then, as we've seen, then the the reaction starts to get hotter and 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 hotter and, hotter and, hotter and, um, and uh, bad things happen. Just like before, this, this theme keeps emerging, right? This is not real. But this starts circulating all over social media, this stuff, right? So I can't tell you how many people asked, reached out and like, hey, you know, we need to talk with all marine biologists and anybody knows anything about toxicology and da, 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 da. And I've done a lot with oil spills. I'm like, yeah, I don't know anything about radiation. I know about oil spills. Like, well, we want you to get on this phone call. And, right? Like people were freaked out. How do I know it was real? Because I, when this happened, I was at a conference in New Orleans uh, giving a paper on what happened with the Deepwater Horizon. And uh, it was lunchtime. I took a break and I went up to my hotel room, took off, which I normally have a, do not have a hotel room in New Orleans. Normally we're staying with friends or whatever. So I, I took off my, my badge and I turned the television on. And because of the way the television had, or the uh, hotel had the television set, it turned on to Fox News. And I'm like, oh, what's this? And then uh, there's a physicist on. I'm like, what? And there's a physicist professor dude that the title you know, says his thing. And he's talking about what's going on. And the hosts of the program, which I'll just say are not known to be really into facts and reality, were sitting there letting the physicist talk for like five minutes and then 10 minutes and then 15 minutes. And they were letting the gentleman talk about reality and say what was going on. And the, the, the host was freaked the hell out, right? And so to get folks on that particular medium that are not always into facts to let a, a technical person just talk was crazy. That, that tells you how scared people were. 
So these things start showing up, right? And people implied that this was radiation. So my lecture the other week, what, what, what were we talking about? Oh yeah, so I, 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 we're talking about disinformation and how it's important to read, you know, I get that little quick thing. YouTube blocked that. So YouTube took my video down. So I posted it for you guys. And the AI said, you're promoting disinformation. I was like, <laughs> what? No, I was talking about disinformation, right? Uh, we can argue whether that's good or not. I think that when you lecture about disinformation, you should be able to share that. But anyway, um, but that stuff wasn't in place back then, right? So all this stuff just goes out completely unfiltered, right? And it's all about clickbait and all these outlandish claims start coming. In. Everybody's freaked out all on the West Coast. And, you know, scientists are like, yeah, you know, you don't need to worry about it, right? The people need to worry about it. the people in, in Japan immediately around the plant. So, so again, particularly with radiological releases, the, the popular general public impression runs the show, right? That's what's going to get people to freak out and jump on the highway and get in a car accident because they're barreling so, you know, going so fast, et cetera. Uh, and then we start seeing, you know, predictions of this and, oh my God, it's coming in a couple of days and all this and that. Um, and, and, you know, people start saying, can't eat any food from this area, et cetera. Um, and then we see a phenomenon that uh, has, has since grown more powerful, which is this citizen science approach. So one of the questions is, what is the real risk, right? Is this really dangerous? Is this not really dangerous? Um, and so uh, essentially a bunch of hackers get together and because there, there aren't enough Geiger counters out there, you know, radiation detectors out there. And so they figure out how we can hack together a quick one of these. And they start putting the instructions out on the web for free. And then um, they start a, 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 eventually start a nonprofit where you can buy one of these. And with the profits, you, they send one to you and they make one or more and they send those to folks in the impacted area, right? And so now, instead of having a few sensors around, now we have a ton of sensors. And now we can start to actually see what's the real risk to people and critters and whatever, right? So we have, so now, now is this sensor here as accurate as the, you know, I don't know, $2,000 sensor I can buy? Probably not, but it's pretty close, right? And the benefit is this costs, you know, 50 bucks or a couple hundred bucks and that's it. So while it'd be great to have that one super accurate, awesome sensor, I would personally rather have 10, not quite as good sensors, but 10 sensors and be monitoring a bunch of places, right? And that's actually gonna get us to a better understanding of the environmental exposure, the potential risk and predicting more accurately, you know, where the radiation moved and, and all this and that. And so, so uh, SafeCast is one of the great success stories, positive things that have come out of this uh, of this experience. And so here's an example of their, one of their um, safe cast maps from 2014, right? So this is a bunch of these essentially citizen science data collection sensors. And then just like you guys do in GIS, they've just creamed it, right? So they just, they just made the, the best fit. And so what you see is uh, not, not surprising, right along the coast is the highest concentration. And you know where the wind sort of blew inland, uh, 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 landward, um, we have you know slightly higher concentration, but then it falls off fairly quickly, right? And uh, and there we go. And so I think I'll just I think I'll say that. Uh, but what we've seen as a consequence is now again people are like, whoa, maybe this nuclear stuff isn't really the best way to go. So Japan starts down a path of beginning to move away. You know, Japan was one of the most embracing of nuclear power countries in the world. After this, there was such public outcry and all this and that, that essentially they've begun a, a, a phasing out period, which will take decades, but nevertheless, they are phasing out of nuclear power because of the Fukushima Daiichi plant um, failure. So China is putting in a lot of capacity, but pretty much that's it. Pretty much that's it. Uh, everywhere else, so in most of the rest of the world, 
the red, the, the pinks here are much larger than the greens. Greens are new insulations, reds are shutting down. Um, right, and that, and yeah, so there we go. I will see that there too. Okay, so then this is influencing us as well. So we'll just end with this, um, which is uh, right now, California has um, one nuclear uh, uh, for, for power. We have some experimental reactors and stuff, but, but as far as commercial feeding electricity on the grid, we have one. When I started teaching here, we had two. We had San Onofre down in Orange County. We have Diablo Canyon up in San Luis Obispo. Diablo Canyon is still running at the moment. San Onofre is shut down. So um, it, it's this plant began in the late 60s. This is if you guys are going to San Diego, you know, and you're on the and you're on the freeway and you look right to the coast. This is this is right before you get to like Camp Pendleton kind of area. That, that's where this is. Um, and so everything's operating now. How our nuclear power plants go, as most people, you get an operating license that's for a certain amount of time. Just like a bridge has a certain amount of time, our elevators have a certain amount of time. They're like, hey, I certify your elevator is going to work for this long, blah, blah, blah. And then at the end of that, you either have to get rid of the elevator or put a new elevator in or, you know, service and maintain the elevator, make sure it's working, right? So that, that's a normal thing. So we have these, what's called the operating life of the plants. Uh, and so things are going on. Uh, we're getting to the late 90s and people are checking them. We start to see um, some various issues with some of the, the tubes that move water around in the system. Like, okay, you know, we need, we need to, to fix some stuff. And so about a decade ago, um, we start taking the units offline and we, uh, we start to replace, we, we get a new, new parts put the parts in, start running it. And within a couple months, problems start to show up. Massive wear and tear very, very quickly. Like, like decades of tear in, in a few weeks, months. You can't figure it out, can't figure it out. Long story short, it turns out it was bad design. So uh, there was a couple different options. Uh, we, you know, could have sued the manufacturer and this and that, but long story short, it ends up saying, the feds end up saying, shut it down. So that's where we are right now. So there, um, there wasn't a, you know, a meltdown or anything, but there was, we noticed with regular inspection, we noticed there was this problem. There was a few little leaks here when, when, the, when we first noticed it, but, but nothing significant. But we attempted to repair it. The repair didn't work. And so rather than continuing to try to try to try it, we just started the process of shutting it down. The shutting it down will take a long time. The plant is still there. All the radioactive material is still on site, but, but it is not producing electricity and we're in the process of what we call decommissioning the plant. That's San Onofre, that's owned by Southern California Edison. That's our electrical uh, 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 default electrical supplier. Then up the coast, there's Diablo Canyon, right by Cal Poly, Avila Beach, right, right up there. So if you guys came with me on the, our coastal management trip, we, this is one of the places we, we drive by. So um, most of our, and I should also say, when we were in the 60s, everybody, we're going to put a nuclear plant there, we're going to put one there. So there was one that was going to go right, um, basically, to Panga Canyon, essentially, in, in Malibu, on one of the hills there. There were all these pro pro plans, of, let's put them here, here, here. Most of those plans do not survive. One of them that does survive is uh, the Diablo Canyon plant. Um, and uh, uh, start going on various issues over time. One of them, the, the, the most classic one was this guy right here, where we, um, we installed the emergency sprinkler system exactly reversed. So the engineering plan is supposed to be like this. And for reasons I don't fully understand, they were flipped. So the whole system was installed backwards, which wasn't like super great, right? Um, Anyway, iron that out, um, start, uh, start operating uh, fully in the, in the 80s, and um, or start going. Flash forward to about five or so years ago, and, um, and PG&E is getting ready to, which is the Northern California Electrical Utility, is getting ready to uh, renew its lease. Right? So they're in the process of this, you know, appealing for an extension and a renewal for the operation of the, of the plant. And we're going on, going on. And, and all of a sudden, 
PG&E says, uh, we want to do this. And a bunch of environmental groups are saying, no, we don't want you to do this. And so they, they basically say, you know what? We're tired of fighting. So that's it. We're done. And everybody was literally in a meeting. They just announced it this afternoon. And people were like, wait, what? I said, yeah, that's it. We are not going to ask for an extension. And so that's essentially where we are now. So starting in 2024, we'll, be, we'll begin shutting down the reactor. And in 2025, we should have no more power produced from there. Um, uh, that, that, that the decommissioning process won't be over. It'll take you know a decade or two longer to decommission. But as far as the benefits, shutting down. So this is what the structure looks like. I wish I could take you guys. When I was an undergrad, I would go on field trips here. Uh, after 9-11, that stuff all ended. So I really wish I could take you guys on a, on a field trip here, but the security is such these days they don't allow us. But basically, um, over here is Avila, Avila uh, Beach, and, um, and this is the, the power plant. What we're looking at here, one of the reasons these plants like the TEPCO plant and these others are on the coast is because we're using the thermal mass of the ocean as the, as the, the thing to help cool the, the steam down, right? So we suck in seawater, cold seawater, put it through the cooling sacks and then let it out and it's a little bit warmer. So as a consequence, this little bay is slightly a couple degrees warmer than the surrounding ocean. And so we have uh, things that tend to be more tropical. So stuff that we have by us, tiger sharks, butterfly fish sometimes, stuff of that nature. That's more, again, like Channel Islands, Catalina, Orange County, uh, um, uh, uh, San Pedro, like, like that sort of area um, is, is in this bay because it, it's, it's so much warmer, um, relatively speaking. Uh, so where we are now is this is shutting, this is in the process of shutting down. But what we've done now is this has now become a test bed, this and a location off of Humboldt for uh, offshore wind. Why? Because we think we can, um, uh, and we're getting ready to start selling leases in a few months. The idea is that then companies will start putting some experimental turbines out in the ocean. And because of all of this, check this out, all of, you can see all these massive uh, high tension wires, right? It's a lot of electricity coming out here. We can use that existing infrastructure, grid infrastructure, run our offshore uh, energy cables, electrical cables onto shore here and tap into this network. So instead of feeding nuclear power, we'd be feeding wind power or possibly tidal power into the grid. Um, but, it's a huge deal, right? Because as problematic as nuclear power is, and we've been talking about potential releases, radiological releases, huge problem, it is, right, a relatively carbon light source. And so as we've lost San Onofre, as we're about to lose Diablo Canyon, we're losing a lot of our carbon neutral uh, or, or, or non-fossil fuel intensive um, electrical generation capacity. And that's a problem because this stuff can run at midnight. This stuff can run during a storm. This stuff can run you know, when, you know, whenever we need it to, whereas these other sources don't always have that capacity. Our energy generation in California, our, our, we were about, I should know this off my head. Uh, I wanna say we were about, we were about 62% of our electricity about a year and a half or so ago in the state of California, electrical energy that we generate was carbon neutral or, or renewable. Now we're down to like 57% because of the drought. So we're losing our hydrological, our ability to generate electricity from some of our dams. And so we're going down as opposed to going up, right? We were going up for a while. So losing, losing this facility is gonna be hard to deal with, to hard, make it harder for us to make our, our, our climate change uh, management targets, but um, but anyway, there you go. Questions? Questions about this stuff? Yeah.
Good question. So the question is, hey, so I mentioned before that all of the, um, in the US at least, all of the spent fuel rods are maintained on site. They're still on site. So all the ones in San Onofre are still there. All the ones at Diablo Canyon are still here. I think, I think they're up here, but I don't, I don't remember. I can't remember exactly where. So yeah, so if you're in Orange County right now, so you do not have an active, um, an active uh, uh, reactor going. So that's cool, right, in terms of your risk. But it also means you're not getting any of the benefit from that electricity. But you still have a bunch of radioactive material sitting there next to the freeway, right? So it's sort of like uh, a lot of the downside, not all the downside, but a lot of the downsides without any of the benefits right now. And the same will be true for Battle King. We had proposed a long-term storage facility at a place called Yucca Mountain. In, uh, in, in Nevada. And Harry Reid, the then senator, the then head of the um, uh, Senate, uh, who just recently died, um, was a very powerful guy. He essentially blocked it, said, nope. So we do not have, that was in like a sort of salt mine, like deep, deep salt mine kind of thing. And, uh, and, and we do not have uh, a place to put this stuff now. Waste to add more fuel, um, so we have 